when we uh, estimate uh, holding period returns, we can use Taylor series. If we're using continuously compounding holding, uh, holding period returns, the best estimate is minus modified duration times the change in rates uh, plus one half convexity minus modified duration squared. If you recall last time we noted that that's a different result than if you use discrete compounding. Uh, and so um, there are some advantages or some evidence that this actually fits better with continuous compounding. So the issue of whether or not to measure holding period returns with discrete or continuous is a decision that a quant has to make. And again, we have the holding period return is either the dollar change divided by the value or with continuous compounding, it is the log of the price relative or the new price divided by the old price. Both bond valuation, uh, you, you can use discrete or continuous and holding period returns, you can use discrete or continuous influence bond risk measures. A barber demonstrates that approximating con continuously compounding rates using uh, of returns using duration only or duration and convexity is much more accurate than the more traditional discretely compounding rates of return. Uh, curve shifts uh, involve levels, slope, and curvature. Several authors introduce more complex models. This is emanating off the empirical observation that yield curves don't shift parallel. This is a uh, these two charts come from stockcharts.com. The link is given up here, uh, which is a really fantastic um, uh, service that these people provide. Notice here that the long end of the curve was more vol volatile and steepening, or actually was coming back down, I suspect. And here you have the short end more volatile. And so it's been my experience that parallel shifts is just not rich enough to capture the risk that I'm trying to uh, manage. And so the empirical evidence, Fisher and Will conclude that the reductions in bond portfolio risk measure are so dramatic that we conclude that a properly chosen portfolio of long-term bonds is essentially riskless. That was that holding period return analysis that we saw in the last video. Um, uh, and so several authors introduced more complex models as parallel shifts may be an inadequate assumption. Um, duration as a risk measure, this particular chart just illustrates that a 9% bond is more sensitive to rate changes than an 11% bond. And here you can see the, the sensitivities. These percentage changes in price are higher than the 11%. The 9% coupon bond has a longer duration, so you would expect it to have a higher percentage change. Um, the, uh, this is just a manual calculation of duration and convexity, assuming discrete compounding. And uh, I'm not going to take the time to go through this, but it's probably a good idea to be somewhat familiar to how these things are actually calculated. Affected duration and convexity. Um, again, they, they incorporate the cash flow adjustment features. And so the, um, with a, the key is with a straight bond, what you'll notice is when rates go up or down by 250 basis points, the effective duration and effective convexity really doesn't change that much. But with a callable bond, if rates go way down, the bond will essentially be called, and so the effective duration shortens considerably. If rates go up, the bond will not be called, and it, the effective duration, if you'll notice, becomes uh, identical to a straight bond. And so a, a, a bond that's callable at a very low rate um, in, in a high rate environment behaves just like a straight bond. In the case of a puttable bond where the investor can put the bond back to the, to the company, you get the opposite result. When rates go up, the investor wants to put it back. When rates go down, they'll keep it. And again, when rates go down, the behavior is much like a straight bond. So the embedded optionality has an effect on uh, how sensitive yields are, how, how sensitive prices are to changes in yield. And for, the, for a callable bond, it basically sets a ceiling on how high the bond price can go when rates go down. With a puttable bond, it sets a floor uh, on, on how low rates can go when rates go up. And so... Um, if we look at effective duration and maturity, if this is actually a, a look at uh, several 
U.S. Treasury bonds, the entire set of uh, Treasury bonds is reported in the Wall Street Journal, as I recall. And we see that there's a direct relationship uh, between effective duration and maturity. If we look at effective convexity and maturity, again, we have a similar type of relationship. Uh, effective convexity and effective duration, we can see clearly that the analytics are very, very closely related, although it's a nonlinear relationship. Um, yield curve changes, we're going to look at, uh, observe numerous different types of changes in the yield curve over time. The changes are not just parallel as assumed by traditional risk measures like duration and convexity. And so in December 31st, 1979, the one month change, what we had is the initial rate here, the, the rate after a month was up here. And so we basically had rates going up, um, but the long rate went up more than the short rate. And so in September 28th, 1984, we had rates going down, and it appears here that the, the uh, short end of the curve, the rates actually moved more, as you can see in this difference line. And so in the previous case, we had um, the long rate moving more than the short rate. In this case, we have the short rate moving more than the long rate. And we need analytics that can capture these sorts of effects. You can have um, the, the uh, twist in the curve, and so if you ask somebody, did rates go up over this period on September 30th, 2008? Well, the question, the answer is it depends. If we're talking about short rates, rates went down. If we're talking about long rates, rates went up. Uh, in the case of uh, April 30th, 2010, uh, we have the opposite result that we had here in that the short rate actually went up just a little bit, long rates went down. And so we need a, we need a mechanism to capture not only level changes, but slope and curvature changes. And that brings in the LSC model. And so uh, the bond value, the yield to maturity versus the value for a low coupon and normal coupon and a high coupon, uh, 1.125, 2.25, and 3.75. We note different bond values and sensitivities. Macaulay's duration, we have the same sort of pattern uh, remember, um, the, the, the uh, Macaulay duration assumes a parallel shift in the curve. Um, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to seek to decompose the holding period return with the LSC model. I don't want to go into all the technical math in this particular uh, presentation, uh, but you have this material uh, provided to you uh, uh, on the website. And this is based on uh, published work by myself and uh, Professor Upton um, in the Journal of Investing in 2017. And so what we want to do is we want to take the bond holding period return and decompose it into four main components. The first component is a horizon component. So if I own a bond portfolio and, and I hold it for, say, one month, and rates don't change at all, uh, the yield curve stays exactly the same, what is my holding period return just for the mere passage of time? That's what this horizon component seeks to answer. And in my opinion, a bond, an active bond manager shouldn't get any compensation for that effect. Uh, and, and so we, we want to sort of set that aside and then there'll be a spread component. And that's the uh, change in the fitted spread curve, which is the spread over some base rate component. Um, and then there's an interaction component. Uh, and so the way this is going to work is we're, we're going to have a modified duration at the uh, uh, for level, modified duration for slope, modified duration for curvature. We'll have the same measures for convexity, and then we'll have a bunch of cross convexities. It's important to note at the moment if level, if if modified duration and focusing solely on level accomplishes your objective, then quit. There's no reason to go any more complicated. If you need more precision, you might go to level and slope. If it turns out that you, the particular pool of money that you're managing, say asset liability management at a bank, and you've already mitigated the level exposure based on modified duration, then, then you want to know how much slope exposure, curvature exposure, and what are my convexity exposures. Rarely, uh, I suspect, do you need to worry about cross convexities 
as they tend to be very small. Uh, my perspective is let's have all the tools we need and then we'll discard the ones we don't need. And so uh, diagrammatically, I have some bond holding period return. I'm going to uh, have four component pieces, horizon, spot rate, spread, and interaction. These are going to be built in a manner that gives you exactly the bond holding period return. Uh, interaction kind of captures everything that's missing. Based on Taylor series, we're going to estimate modified duration convexity and cross convexity. And because it's a Taylor series, there's going to be an estimation error. We want to pay attention to this estimation error to make sure that we're not missing uh, the bulk of the phenomenon we're trying to capture. Modified duration can be broken down into level, slope, and curvature. Convexity can be the same. Cross convexity has three pairs. And so that's, that's uh, pretty much the goal here. The spread component, if you'll notice, is nearly identical, except for we're going to do the same analysis on the spread. You can think of the spread as the credit spread or the, the spread over some base curve. So if I'm managing a portfolio of double B bonds, then I've got a credit spread over the spot rate curve, and that's going to be what I'm going to focus on. Um, just to give you a, a conceptual illustration, if I take a two-year bond that's trading at a U.S. Treasury plus 100 basis points, and I have level, slope, and curvature with these parameters, the horizon is one month, the bond holding period return can, uh, can be decomposed assuming at horizon, that the spread blew out 100 basis points and uh, the long rate went down, the slope went positive and the cur uh, curvature went positive. And so what does this look like? The initial curve looks something like this. Uh, the, at horizon, the rates went way up on the short end. They went up some on the long end. And so this is the difference. And so if I want to decompose my holding period returns, uh, this is uh, quite messy. But if I have a two-year bond, compare that to a 10-year bond and a 30-year bond, what you'll notice is the horizon component, 11 basis points for the two-year and 34 basis points for the 30-year. Um, the spot rate component for the two-year is uh, down 7.67%. With the 30-year, um, it's down only 4.19%. But if you'll notice the spread component, this is down 1.9, and the spread component for the 30 year is down uh, 16%. And so the total uh, sensitivity, the long bond lost 20.75%, the two year bond only lost 9.45%. And what you can observe, and again, without getting mired in the details, is that I can decompose, say, this. Uh, 7.6737% into level slope and curvature. Uh, I can do the same at the 10-year and the 30-year bond, and, and we can do the same with convexity and cross convexities. For the most part, the cross convexities are small, and the uh, con uh, convexities themselves are small, uh, in part because we're just looking at the asset, not an already balanced portfolio. And so uh, fitting the term structure, Kraken and Nawaka note that up to 95% of the re uh, returns on U.S. Treasury Securities portfolio are explained by the term structure level shifts, slope shifts, and curve shifts. Uh, and in maturity time, it's non-stochastic shape of the term structure at a particular point in time. And so Wilner in 1996 uh, posited that... Um, a desirable properties of uh, a curve fitting routine must uh, incorporate for what the bond portfolio managers need for intuitive, descriptive, and comprehensive risk exposure information. The LSC model that I'm presenting here uh, satisfies Wil Wilner's uh, constraints, and uh, I found it extremely useful in practical solving practical uh, problems within the interest rate risk management arena.